Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week I built a table so big I have to sell my old forklift to buy a new forklift, and absolutely everything goes wrong with this build. About a year and a half ago or so now, I had this really nice couple reach out and say that they're building their dream house in Florida. They'd seen some of my past videos and they wanted a table just like one they'd seen with one caveat. They could not have any red hues to it. They hated the look of red hues in this walnut. I said, no problem. Although red is pretty common, it's not exclusive to walnut. So since we had time to buy a green slab that had been fresh cut, I found the deepest, darkest chocolatey slab on Gobi Walnut's website. And they said that color would be perfect. However, I bought a couple slabs from that tree and I recently finished one of those tables and it was, as my wife put it, maybe one of the reddest tables I've ever built. So this is the problem. We have a very red slab and I promise them anything but. I get countless questions from people asking me why I don't use some sort of roller system, just throw some offcuts of PVC pipe in the back of my truck and that's how the Egyptians moved all those stones and it's good enough for them, it's good enough for you and this time was gonna be the time that I actually did this and I left them sitting next to my truck. So now no rollers underneath my slab and I have to muscle it out by hand. So enjoy. So as you can see, we are already starting off with some issues and moving these big slabs around or struggling to move these big slabs around, that is nothing new. That is something I struggle with on pretty much every project, but the slab that is the wrong color, that is a brand new problem for me and not something I've ever experienced before. I did tell the clients about it so they are aware of the problem, but we're gonna take this just one step at a time. And here we are choosing a layout and doing this via FaceTime, making sure they like the layout, make sure that I can at least get that part right. This table is going to end up right around 108 inches long by 45 inches wide, which I believe is right around 2.7 meters by 1.2 meters. And to make sure that I hit that size and I don't have to tell the client that I accidentally built them a smaller table, I always start off a little bit oversized, which is why you see the two white lines there. One is the minimum size and the other one is kind of my size with a buffer. And this circular saw can cut, I think, almost three and a half inches deep, but this slab must have been just a little bit over that because I couldn't quite get it and use my jigsaw on one section. But for this part, I went ahead and used the foot saw. I have built enough of these tables that I can generally envision what they're going to look like pretty close from the raw slab, but the clients have not built a bunch of tables. So there is some trust that needs to go into this when you're choosing a layout because we only really had this one corner that could fill this void. So if it didn't look right, we weren't really gonna be able to do anything with it. And lucky for me, the client loved this look. I posted about it on the YouTube community page and on Instagram a bunch, but if you missed it, you won't be seeing this planner anymore because all of our machinery reached out, offered me a better planner. And instead of selling that one for like $3,000 on Craigslist, I decided to host a rock, paper, scissors tournament where the winner would win the planer. So we recently did that up at Gobi Walnut. It was a ton of fun. The guy who won it was an actual woodworker with a small professional business that did not have a good planer. So I thought it was really cool, a ton of fun. If you wanna stay tuned on more contests like that, follow me over on Instagram or at least check out the YouTube community page. Now, if you're wondering what I am doing with all these samples, this is phase one of hopefully keeping the clients happy. These are offcuts from the actual slab of wood that their table is made from, and they are pretty familiar with Rubio Monaco. They've been using it on their baseboards and their doors in their new house. So they chose three colors. I chose two. I did the charcoal, which is what you see there, and then just the pure natural color is kind of a control. I even had an old epoxy serving board that I did in two colors, so I could show them the slate on the left, the charcoal on the right, and all of these different colors here so they can look at it in their space, see how it reacts with the light and what this table is actually gonna look like. If I could outsource one job, this would be it, the slab cleanup process. It is absolutely miserable. I have to get down on my hands and knees. I get stuff flying up in my face. I end up just filthy. Generally takes me almost a whole day. It is a genuinely unpleasant process, but it is something that is really, really critical. And if you don't get these cleaned up properly, that epoxy bond could be compromised and your table could come apart down the road, which is basically my nightmare. Having a table in Florida come apart and have the client ask me, what are we supposed to do? 
To remove all the bark, rot, strands, and just dirt from these slabs, I use a number of different tools. I really do like the angle grinder, but it's not great at getting down into those tight spots. I have these nylon attachments for my drill, but they're kind of a lighter duty and better for kind of the non-marring bark removal of like a nice clean edge that you want to leave exposed. And sometimes the best thing is really just to remove some wood. And that's what I'm doing here is I got my die grinder. I got this little cuts all burr on there and I am physically removing that outer layer because I couldn't get any other tool to get down in there get it cleaned up. And careful there, by the way, and using the die grinder and here I'm switching over to the sphere, I can actually carve away the wood. And that's because I couldn't remove this with any of the other tools. And this is gonna ensure it's just a perfect epoxy to wood bond, no bark, no rot, no anything like that getting in the way of an absolutely perfect timeless bond. I'm told a lot of people watch my videos because they just want to zone out and watch something come together. They tell me they're not a woodworker, they don't want to make a table, they just want to zone out, maybe even fall asleep while watching something come together, which I actually think is super cool and I'm honored by that. But there are people out there that watch my videos because they want to learn how to make these epoxy tables. And the only problem with the YouTube format is that I have to make it super interesting for the entire time. I have to cut out things that are generally important to the epoxy table making process because people will click off it if I leave it in a normal video. So I finally made a virtual epoxy workshop that's like three and a half hours long, has everything you need in there to make your own wood and epoxy table. Step-by-step -step guide, there's PDF guide, there's buying sheets so you can know which products to buy. Everything is in there, nothing is left out, and I will leave a link in the video description if you want some more information on that virtual epoxy workshop. One thing I'm not gonna forget this time, these little PVC rollers, so we'll see how well these work. Oh, if you're wondering what that was, on the way back from getting the slab surfaced, I had the rollers in there, I had one tie down strap, and I wasn't used to how well those rollers can move a slab around, and the slab almost fell all the way out of my truck, and I wanted to get better footage of it, but I also didn't want to go full influencers in the wild and have a tripod set up there with me stopping traffic in the highway with a slab behind my truck. So that was one lesson learned, use more than one tie down. After I sealed every crack, crevasse, top, bottom, and sides, I was ready to start building the form. And this table is gonna be bigger than a four by eight sheet of melamine, which isn't a big deal. And I know there's always people that comment that say that you can buy larger sheets of melamine. I don't have any close to me, and this is actually a really easy way to do it. So what I do, I take that four by eight sheet of melamine and I just added about a foot and a half to it, put a little bit of caulk in between, and then some of this Tyvek tape on top just to be safe. When I work alone, which I guess is basically all the time, I sometimes like to build the form around the slab when I'm working with an oversized table like this. On a smaller table, I can build a form and then just drop that smaller slab directly in the middle of it and it's not a problem. For a big slab like this, if I tried to build a form the exact size and drop it right down in the middle, there's a pretty good chance it would just break one of the sides off and give me all kinds of problems. So what I do here is I build two sides, apply my mold release, and then just kind of scooch the slab over. It does make adding the caulk a little bit more difficult because on the outer two pieces, you can really only caulk it on the outside, but in the end, I find that this system works really well. The attachment of the sides is pretty straightforward. I pretty much always use four inch pieces for the sides. This piece went on just as you would expect with a couple of brad nails and some caulk. The next piece though, I ended up scooting it right up against the wood since I didn't want to cut this four by eight sheet of melamine. It saved me a little bit of work of having to rip off those two inches where I could just scoot that side up right next to the wood. And then I cut a piece in to fill that gap and to make sure it didn't burst open during the epoxy pour, had this other piece of scrap that I used to overlap it for a little bit more strength. Epoxy is one of those sneaky products that you don't realize that is actually only made by a couple of manufacturers. And the manufacturer of this super clear epoxy is actually super clear epoxy or FGCI, which is written right there on the label, 
What you might not realize though is that FGCI actually makes the epoxy for a ton of different companies. And it doesn't mean it's the same epoxy going into each bottle because each company can give them their own formula that they want them to make. But what it does mean is that super clear epoxy can make the best product at the most cost effective price. And yes, they are a longtime supporter of my channel. So do your own research. But it's one of those kind of fun facts, like I didn't know the manufacturer of my new planer, Oliver, actually makes the planers for Grizzly and Shop Fox and Laguna and Powermatic. They're all made at that Oliver factory. So kind of a fun fact if you didn't know about the epoxy. I have probably mixed a thousand gallons of epoxy, and this is the first time it ever occurred to me to get the bucket off the ground to straighten my spine out for the mixing process. And I don't accept responsibility for not knowing this. I blame you guys. You guys are always quick to point out all my safety shortcomings, telling me to put the rollers in the back of my truck. Somebody should have pointed this out to me years ago. This next bit is something that I've never actually done in an epoxy table build before. This was about a day later. You can see the epoxy is still really soft, but it's actually kind of slick and smooth. I waited maybe just a little bit too long. It's not sticky. So I took the plastic knife and I just went and I roughed it up a lot. And I wouldn't do this on a clear pour or a transparent pour, but since it's black, this is going to give it more surface, a better grip. And whether it's completely necessary or not, probably doesn't really matter. But I thought I would just do it just to be safe and make sure I got a really, really good chemical bond from one layer to the next. I get a lot of questions about why do I do these pours in multiple layers sometimes and why do I do them in one layer another time and it's not entirely obvious when you should and when you shouldn't if you don't have much experience with this. So if you don't know, epoxy heats up when it cures. So some people think that a four inch pour would take a really long time to cure. However, a four inch pour is gonna generate a ton of heat and cure really, really quickly. Whereas like a half inch pour is gonna not generate much heat and cure very, very slowly. So I like to limit my pours to anywhere from inch and three quarters to two and a half inches at the most, anything over that. And I highly recommend doing in two pours. This time for the trip across town, I am still gonna use the PVC rollers. I like the idea of those in theory, as long as I'm able to strap it in. So just to be safe, I'll add about two dozen or so ratchet straps to make sure this makes it all the way to creative woodworking. As long as I've been posting videos where I go up to this woodworking shop in Portland to rent time out on their big industrial tools, you guys have been asking me in the comments, how can I find a shop like that near my hometown? And for the longest time, I was like, ah, call around a cabinet shop or use the yellow pages if those still exist. And finally, after enough people asked me and enough time went by, I got the bright idea of thinking, maybe there should be a website with all this information. And so I finally made that website. It's different than my regular website. It's called makerbook.io and anybody can go on there, upload your space, big or small. You can classify it as a hobby shop, semi-professional or professional. So you can rent time out, maybe pay for some of those tools. You can either use the tools yourself on the person's project, or it can be more of like a makerspace environment. And you should do your own research, get your own liability insurance, anything if you're gonna have people using your tools. But I think it's a really cool resource to get more tools out there available to more people and really lower that cost of entry to start woodworking. Couple little bonus tips for you here is once you get your piece surfaced, it's nice and smooth. For the rest of the project, keep a piece of this styrofoam underneath it. You can get it from Home Depot for like 10 bucks a sheet. And that way when you're sliding it around, flipping it over, you won't put any dings or dents in it. And also this plastic wrap will really help minimize any warping that can happen when you're leaving it overnight and not working on it. Also, there's the sheet of melamine from the project. I can actually use that on another project, so it's not a total waste. It's not a one-time use product. One of the nice things about working from home, or at least 20 feet from home, is that I can work late, and I usually do, but one of the downsides to working when other businesses aren't is you can't go buy things from businesses, and that's what happened here. Is I was in the middle of that cut, and my vacuum started making a horrible noise, and opened it up and that sack was about as hard as a sack of concrete because you could not wedge another speck of dust into it. And so I had to go my old school way of cleaning it out with my dust collector like I used to do when I was broke. And now I try to keep bags on hand, but for some reason this time I was out of bags. Ideally when you're shopping slabs, you want to slab near the center of the tree, but not in the dead center of the tree. And it's not that you can't use them, but it has what you see there is called the pith, which is that little round circle, which is the heart of the tree. And that pith is prone to cracks and checks and other defects and other instabilities. 
So this one, as you can see there, had some resin filled up in those cracks, but I still wanted to add a little more stability to it. So I'm adding kind of a larger oversized bow tie and just in the hopes of keeping that pit together a little bit tighter. As far as making and installing these bow ties, it's something that I actually enjoy, but it is pretty tedious. Each one takes me about 30 minutes to do, so time spent doing this means I can't be doing something else. And this last weekend, I went to like a woodworking YouTuber conference in Atlanta. And if you're wondering, yes, there is a woodworking YouTuber conference. And my dad said, he goes, what was there, like four of you there? And apparently there's a few more than that, but one of the things that came up with a number of people is they use CNC's and some people give them a hard time about it, just like people give me a hard time about everything else. But the only reason I don't use a CNC is because I'm too intimidated because I don't know how to program it, I don't know how to run it. And I wanna know what you guys think. If I had a CNC to knock these out pretty quick, would that take anything away from the video versus watching me do it by hand or is a CNC just as cool as doing it by hand? I am probably like a lot of you out there who have small shops or small businesses in that we have a hard time letting go. It seems like nobody's gonna care about your project as much as you care about it. And anytime somebody else gets their hands on it, something goes wrong. And this steel base is the opposite of that. I said a lot of things went wrong in this project, but this is something that I can just send to my guy in kind of Southern-ish Oregon and know that it's gonna come back perfect. He's a young guy, he's super busy, he doesn't probably need the work. And it's definitely not in my best interest to share his information because that means he's gonna get too busy for me but I think people should be rewarded when they do really good work. And it's not any type of trade. I pay him full price for everything, but his name is Bryson Steele. I'll include a link to his shop in the video description below because he really is that good. This is a trick that I came up with a couple years ago because I couldn't find a router bit big enough to cut these chamfers or chamfers or bevels or whatever you guys are gonna mock me for saying it wrong. And what I do is I just overlap that track slightly and I run a 22 degree cut, which makes for a really interesting edge profile. And it is a lot more difficult than it looks because it's really hard to get all four sides lined up just perfectly. So what I actually just did was I ordered this comically oversized custom made router bit that I don't even know that I have a router big enough to turn. So we'll see how that goes. I use a ton of this CA glue and activator to fill all the tiny little pits and imperfections in the wood and the epoxy. and the black stuff is pretty cool, but it's so thin that it tends to stain the wood and the gel does a really good job of filling up these holes. So what I've started doing is actually start mixing them. And I don't know that you can mix every brand with every brand. And I think one of these is Starbond and one of the other ones is P2P and they seem to mix fine. So if you want a little bit better way to fill these dark cracks and dark pits without staining the wood, you can try mixing it up. I mentioned in a past video that one of the best tools you can get to put out a better finished product is a wife with OCD because she will come out and make you feel really, really bad about anything that is going to a customer that isn't perfect. And if you're trying to sell tables like this one that's $13,500, you kind of need that. And I'm not a very OCD person by nature, but having her there to look over my shoulder and make sure that I spent enough time filling all of the little imperfections is really, really critical. And at first it kind of stings, but I've met a lot of better woodworkers than me that put out really kind of marginal products and it's things that I know they can fix, but they just don't for whatever reason. And the reason probably is that wife. And here's some more of those imperfections. I came back, noticed that they were really tiny. So I actually carve out a little bit of it and that will allow that CA glue to fill up that gap instead of just sitting on top of that tiny little hole. And again, it's just one of those things that if you want to get the top dollar, get the most for your product, just make it as nice as you possibly can. I usually budget between one and two days to get all these imperfections filled and go through all my sanding progressions. And if you're curious, I generally start at 100 grit, go to 120, 150, 180, and then I put my finish on. And I get a lot of questions from people that ask, well, why don't I go from 100 to 180? Or why don't I just start at 180? And that's kind of a longer, more boring conversation, but the short answer is that's how the sandpaper is designed to be used. It's supposed to go up by those grit increments. Also, I get questions from people ask, why don't I go to 400 grit? Or why don't I go to 1,000 or 4,000 grit? And the short answer is you get better protection with this particular finish, leaving it at those lower grits. If you use this on like a floor, for example, they recommend leaving it at like 100 to 120 grit. Now, you might think that this looks a little shocking, and this is Rubia Monaco. This is one of their colors. I've never used one of their colors on a full-size table before, and yes, it does look like black paint right now. And I was a little nervous. I was glad that I did those samples because those gave me a much better idea 
what to expect. So I knew it wasn't gonna look like black paint like it looks right here, but I, I will admit, I was slightly nervous at this point. When I was making those samples, I tried a number of different methods to get the desired look that we wanted, and the look that we liked best was achieved by letting this finish sit for a day or two, coming back, sanding with a maroon pad like I do normally with my tables, and then we add one coat of the Rubio Pure, and this Pure is just the natural, no colors, no dyes, no stains added. What this does was it leaves the color, the look that we like, but brings out that natural grain and really just completely evens out the sheen. I mentioned earlier how hard it is for me to relinquish control, and I wish I could take this from the slab to the living room without having to use anybody else. And a couple problems with that is I am, first off, not strong enough to move this table on my own. Second off, these particular clients are in Florida, so that means I got to ship it, which I usually have to ship, and it's something that's always really stressful. So I build an absolute world-class crate. I might not be a world-class woodworker, but I build world-class crates, and the styrofoam foam is something that I have really become fond of, and you can actually cut it with a table saw, but there is one potential problem. Anybody know what happened? And if you own a saw stop, there's a decent chance you've seen this before, and if you don't know, a saw stop is a table saw that won't cut you, and so as soon as it senses conductivity, whether that's your finger or apparently a piece of foil on an insulation board, it'll stop. All right, I hope you guys appreciate what I do for you and I intentionally triggered this saw stop to show you just how this cartridge works. And if you actually believe that, you are a really, really true fan. But if you're curious, here's what we got. We got this little aluminum cartridge and as soon as it senses anything conductive like your finger, it triggers and stops the blade basically instantly. And I don't know actually why it triggered on part of the foam board and not other parts. So maybe someone out there is smart enough to leave me a comment, but Sometimes the blade is lost. This one I bet we'll be able to salvage. I'll have to take it to my sharpening service, get it straightened, get it resharpened, maybe replace a tooth or two, replace the cartridge, like 80 bucks. So all in all, kind of a bummer, but lesson learned. The first house I ever bought was a foreclosure down in Texas, and it was a disaster. Everything was wrong with it, but it was $92,000, so I'm not sure what I should really be expecting. And I had some plumbing problems. I had two different plumbers show up to look at a job and both of them just looked at it and said, nope, I'm not doing it, not for any amount of money. And finally got a third plumber and he just looked at it and just goes, yeah, no problem. And I was surprised and I said, isn't this a big pain? And he goes, yeah, everything I do is a pain. And I really like that. And that's the attitude I try to model myself after, which is easier said than done, but if you can just accept that this is the job, we're gonna have things that go wrong. Yes, it's 90 bucks. Yes, it's a blade. Yes, it slowed me down. This happened on a weekend. I couldn't get a new cartridge till Monday. But everything we do is a pain. It will make you feel so much better. You won't feel bad for yourself and you can just concentrate on the work. You might be starting to wonder how I'm going to get this giant crate out of my little shop. And that's a very, very fair concern. And this could end up being one of those Winnie the Pooh situations where it gets too big and then can't actually get out. And I did just buy a full-size forklift, and by that I mean a pretty much the smallest forklift you can buy because it's all I could afford, and it's a 1994 Yale forklift that I've got these big forklift extensions for, so I actually, again, at this point, don't even know if it will get it out of the shop. I ordered these giant fork extensions from an online company that I'd never used before, and I'm so lazy these days that if someone doesn't have Apple checkout, I almost always just leave because I hate forms that much. But this supplier was by far the best price and even had same day shipping, so I went ahead. And I had been using Roboform for a little while up to this point, but this was the first real world test. I was able to input the identity I had previously created, generate a secure password, and make payment in just a few seconds. Now that login information and payment info is saved on my different desktop browsers, my PC laptop, and my iPhone. It's everything that Chrome and Apple try to do, but it works across platforms every time. Not only that, but they've been around for over 20 years, have one owner, so no shareholders to answer to, own their own servers, which is probably why they've never been hacked as well, all for about $2 a month or 30% off that if you click the link in the video description. There are always a lot of really good questions in the comments about these builds, and I try to think of those in advance so you can answer them in the video, but I'm gonna do something a little bit different. And this video, I'm working on a blog just to tell the story about it because it's been like a year and a half in the process of making this table. So if there's a frequent question that keeps coming up, I'll make sure to include that in the blog. I'll also try to answer it in the comments. And if you wanna know what this looked like side by side with the previous kind of sister slab to this table, 
there it is. One of them's very red. The other one kind of looks purple-ish in this camera, which doesn't look so much like that in person, but in the end, I would love to know what you guys think. And I always try to give a little bit of credit to people who make it all the way to the end of the video. So start your question with either better or worse to let me know what you think of this color.